Now, just a little overview, we've been talking for about 35 or 40 minutes. Um, the importance of your drinking water services in your community or development. Working as a team, when we talk about success, really you're talking about your elected officials, your administrators, your operators. They all have to uh, uh, work together and I'll give a picture of what a well-managed municipality in terms of their water and wastewater services looks like. Uh, in other words, we'll also do an overview of sustainable assets, how do you, how you make your, how do you do asset management to sustain your system, and that's always a sore point, especially with economics of scale and challenges facing small systems. Uh, some, a little bit about our, the uh, water and wastewater programs in Alberta, and there's been a few changes lately on that. Uh, innovation in many different forms, uh, and the types of challenges facing small system operators and, and, and elected officials and then at the end of it, given all that, the types of questions that you might want to ask as a counselor uh, and as an administrator, uh, you might want to be asking others and other experts in the field to improve your operations. So we talk about drinking water and wastewater being uh, the foundation of, pu of public health. We take a lot of it for granted, but if you look at this, the history of the world in the last maybe 150 years, probably disinfection of, of drinking water and the way we manage our sanitary sewer has saved more lives than anything else that we've done, including penicillin or anything like that. So it's sometimes taken for granted. And in municipalities often, you know, if you've been at the table or you listen to some of, the, some of the talk, the priorities placed on water and wastewater aren't what they should be. Sometimes they have no problem inviting the fire chief or whoever to a, a council meeting, but just how often is drinking water on the agenda or wastewater? And you could argue that, you know, as a, as a counselor or as an owner of a water system, uh, taking care of your drinking water and wastewater uh, is likely the most important thing you can do. Now, what do you need to know? Just as an overview before we get into some detail. Uh, duties and liabilities. Susan will talk about that, how to be vigilant and diligent in your, in your decision making. Um, who to talk to so you know everything that you have to know. There's a lot of information out there. I'm not talking about internet. I'm talking about, uh, you know, anecdotal discussions and things you have with, with other communities, your neighbors. Uh, there's a lot of inspectors in government that are out there to help. I know you've heard that before. But that's, the program is there if you, if you want to access it. And as a counselor, under, understanding your operator certification requirements is a very basic thing. And know your system. We talk about that. Uh, Steve Rudy in his talks about uh, history of, of things that go wrong. Knowing your system and being aware of the risks is, is, uh, gets you most of the way to, uh, to be successful. Now communication and respect. I call it the dynamic trio. We've had this discussion before. Um, again, uh, I mentioned a regular agenda item. Have an agenda item as a council brings forward the CEO in his discussion with the operators to maintain, to bring forward anything that's happening that's going to be a change or a risk to your system. If something is, a, something, uh, you know, as a counselor, you've got a million things on your plate. You don't really understand the details of everything, so it's important that those kinds of things be refreshed uh, probably on a monthly basis. And one of the things we talk about is having respect for operators. When we, Underwater for Life, we had an operation assistance program to cover off uh, operator uh, uh, sickness, holidays, we tried it as an experiment, we knew it was needed, but a lot of the operators after the fact in Banff told me that they were afraid to admit that they had a problem because it was a sign of weakness and that, that demonstrates that there are some communication issues in certain, in certain places and we want to get around that. Now, what, is a, what does a good system look like and what do you want to accomplish? Again, you've got the you've got the relationship among the among the people that are involved, the counselors, the, the administrators, the operators. 
robustness, which is a common term used for complying with everything in terms of regulatory uh, performance, operator requirements, all those things. So you want to be robust, you don't want to take any chances. Good financial planning and asset management, uh, I'll talk about that in a minute, and then uh, that comes down to uh, full cost accounting processes, so you know your system, you know your challenges over a long period of time. And other planning options, like uh, emergency planning and uh, response and security. And what I mean by security is, uh, you know, are you prepared for something that may happen that's, 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 uh, that's deliberate sabotage or, or, or human-induced? And then at the end of the day, if you've got confident consumers um, that are looking at, when they drink the water or they look at their wastewater system, they feel proud about living in that community, that's, that's success. Now, this is, a, this is a difficult one because the smaller you are as a municipality, the more difficult it is on economics of scale from a capital and operational point of view. So you're looking at uh, billions of dollars are invested in the ground and above ground for water and wastewater. And so it's really the responsibility of government to have good, good legislation and, and municipalities to do their part and to make sure we preserve this, this, uh, this capital investment. And operation is extremely important. So you need to have some way of predicting your, over time uh, how sustainable your systems are. And full cost accounting is one way of doing that. Now before I talk about full cost accounting, we did workshops across the province and it's not about it's not setting rates. Full, uh, setting rates is a lot more than just full cost accounting. Full cost accounting is a process so you know all your operating costs, the assets that, you, that, are, that you're using up, a fancy word for depreciation, what's out there, the age of it, when it's going to have to be replaced, repaired, all those numbers brought to present worth. So you understand what your, what your options are, what your costs are, the best ways to proceed. Um, now, it's also debt obligations, many times you have interest payments and things, so all these things, it's like planning, it's like in a family, you don't necessarily like what you see, but you want to know what, you're going to, what it's going to cost. Now, the benefits gives you, uh, once you go through this, and I'll talk about that in a minute, you know all the, all the, uh, the costs and activities, you'll understand your risks, uh, because you've gone through every aspect of your system with a fine tooth comb, from, from administration to capital to operation. You prioritize your, your, your expenditure items. Now, it also involves, it also results in, in having a rate increase over time that's more like a steady stream than having something where you just sudden investments of capital without knowing when they're going to occur. That can work if you're lucky, but uh, it doesn't generally end up in the best uh, situation over a 40, 50 year period. The cash method sometimes is that way of just inducing cash into the system when it's needed and you put aside so much of your tax base for that. But it's, it's really a hit and miss and, and, uh, and sometimes it doesn't work that well. And if you want to achieve sustainability, you've got to look at the long term. So first, you know, you learn about your system. It means having an understanding of your infrastructure. There's a number of different parts of your infrastructure and they all have different depreciation times. Ch chartered accountant through the Professional Services Advisory Board in Canada will tell you that. But you need to know and have that cost analysis done. That's usually a, an engineering firm, and once you have that infrastructure knowledge, then it's a combination of somebody that understands accounting and present worth analysis and that type of thing that'll do that. And there are companies out there that are well versed in doing that in Alberta. So, it also means having a record of all those things that are gifted, like grants, because essentially if you've operated a system up for the last 40 years and three quarters of it's been bought by government through grants as you're moving forward, do you make that assumption that that's going to continue? Or do you, or, or do you look at more realistic assumptions in terms of have, paying a fair share of, of the system? So those are the kinds of decisions. And I know they're not, they're not easy and there's, there's help out there to make those kinds of decisions. So now once you have all that, you're ready to do your full cost accounting. And we did a series of workshops, and as a result of that, back in 2007, 2008, there's, a, there's a, an ESRD, Environment Sustainable Resource Development, there's a website that actually tells you uh, how to go about and do that. How to break down all your costs, administration, attribute certain costs to water, some to wastewater. It's, it's not that difficult, but uh, you need a good checklist, and that's been developed for doing that exercise. And like I say, there's a number of uh, really good firms out there that, uh, that can do that exercise, but it does cost money. Now, let's talk a little bit about 
the drinking water program and the wastewater programs so you're aware of, of, of what your uh, responsibilities are in those areas. And there's over 600 drinking water systems approved in the province by uh, what used to be Alberta Environment, which is now Alberta Environment and Sustainable Resource Development. The, the lands and forestry and fishery side combined with the environment over the last year and they're just now going through a reorganization. Um, there's more than 3 billion, I would say about 3.3 .3 to 3.4 million, 3.5 million people are served by systems, those 600 systems approved by ESRD that have an approval or a registration. So as an operator you'll understand that. Uh, the other 500,000 are First Nations which are federally controlled, they're now having new regulations where they meet the, or the Alberta regulations but that's going to take some time where their certification process is the same as ours for their operators, there's some challenges there. And there's private systems regulated by Alberta Health and there's a major regulatory review process going on right now to make sure that there's nothing falling between the cracks. So Underwater for Life, which I was part of, that started about 13, 14 years ago, we looked at safe, secure drinking water supplies, healthy aquatic ecosystems, in other words, protecting fish, and reliable uh, quality water supplies for a sustainable economy, and that's got a lot to do with a very controversial water allocation process. We look at uh, a source-to-tap multi-barrier approach, and when we look at that, it's not just what happens in the plant. It's all about, it's, it's, it's from your source to your tap, the administration, administrative functions, the kind of decisions you can make, the kind of knowledge you have that makes a difference in terms of what you end up with for safe drinking water and environmentally acceptable wastewater discharges. So we talk a little bit first about legislation itself that's in place. We've got an act. We don't have a Safe Drinking Water Act in Alberta, which, which we see in some places. But you've got an act and you've got a potable water regulation under it that sets the design and performance standards, the water quality standards. It requires that each of you holds an approval for a surface water facility or a code of practice or registration if you're part of a regional system or a high quality groundwater system. So a community like like Okotoks at one point had a, would have had a registration because it had a fairly simple groundwater system. Now because it has a surface water system it requires a much more sophisticated operator classification and a lot more treatment and so it holds an approval. So uh, other out legislation, the Public Health Act of course has paramountcy of everything over everything in the province. Uh, you'll see if there's any intervention uh, under the nuisance and sanitation regulation, if there's a boil water advisory, it's a health official that issues it in, in, in talking with your operator, environment officials, and the town. The town has a role to play, but health has the bottom line when it comes to that. And there's criteria for that. Uh, Safety Codes Act, the ca Canada's, Canada has a plumbing code, Alberta adopts that. So you're, once you get to the help with, to get on a private property and the plumbing code, there's certain things that you're, you can't have raw water entering a plumbing system. It has to be treated. So it all ties together. So that's where the source to tap comes in. Now as far as protection is concerned, um, these are all preventative or proactive actions. Like, so source protection. Make sure as a community you're, you're aware of what's going on with the watershed protection plan and at the table to, to make sure your interests are protected in terms of how that land and that watershed is being used. Because you want your drinking water to be as a source to be as consistent in quality as possible. Well-trained operators, that's a proactive preventative me uh, measure. Uh, anticipation of events. So you want to be able to uh, have good emergency response planning. You can't always control what happens when those things, what causes those things, but you can be ready for them. And that's really important. Waterworks systems. So we want state-of-the-art waterworks systems. We've got design standards for that. So the consultants that are required with the PN stamp on the drawing that says, I know I've, I've, I've designed this according to meet the standards. I know what design and performance standards are. It assures that the design is there. The most important thing is having an operator that's well supported to, design, to keep that plant, and like I say, running really well. And we've got billions of dollars invested, so the operation is the key. Um, innovation, drinking water safety plans. Uh, that's a new form of, of uh, we're looking at uh, 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 knowing your own system, being able to deal with the risks associated with that, do the monitoring and reporting, and, and, and dealing with certain things that you know are a high risk, as opposed to the, everybody having the same kind of boilerplate approach to the, the system. And then of course there's grant funding, which has been happening for 40 years in one shape or another. Um, it's been very generous, Alberta's very generous so far with the funding, funding, but you never know in the future whether you can count on that level of funding or not. 
Now, performance assurance is what happens in the field. And you all, like I say, you all have, a, you all have an approval or registration which outlines your monitoring and reporting requirements. It's very important that you stick to that. Your operator knows. So uh, if you have any questions, you need to have your CEO and your operator dealing with your councils. Uh, operational assistance, like I said a few years ago, the Underwater for Life, they did an operation assistance program, but it wasn't, the uptake wasn't as good as it should have been because operators were afraid to say, I have a problem. And that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be the culture. Uh, compliance inspections, uh, we have people out, out there uh, uh, doing inspections for compliance, but we also have drinking water operational specialists. So if the operator has a question, we have experts that can answer that. And they're out there. There's a half a dozen of those in the province. And of course, then there's the, the, the black hat guys that Susan might talk about a little bit, is they're out there because there's been a boo-boo and, and somebody has to uh, explain what's happening. Knowledge, often forgotten. It's a barrier, but it's, it's a different type of barrier. It's where the knowledge is required to assure that you have good decision making in your community. So you've got your watershed, your source protection, your, 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 your uh, Alberta Water Council and, and, and your, your watershed protection advisory committees. There's lots of knowledge, lots of, lots of expertise. Research to keep track of, uh, of innovation and emerging technologies, and we'll talk about innovation in a few minutes. Your standard operating procedure, does your operator have a good standard operating procedure so that if that operator leaves or, or takes leave of any kind, that there's somebody there that can take over without, without a flash. It's just, uh, it's just good planning. Uh, we talked about drinking water safety plans, knowing your risks. As counselors, you realize that uh, by January 1st of 2014, you're supposed to have a drinking water safety plan in place, and if you don't have any questions, we have, there's people in the government that can help you with that as well. And of course, some communities, it's been common across the world for communities to have regular three or four times a year, they, they put a little blurb in their community just saying this is what we've done to make sure your water is safe and be, have confidence in the quality of your water and our drinking water is safe, our drinking water and our wastewater are in compliance with the government and we're in good shape. So that, that confidence thing is really important. Our, so that's, that's the flower or the daisy or whatever and uh, that makes up a good uh, robust uh, water treatment plan or water treatment approach. On the wastewater side it's not nearly as, as uh, colorful. I mean again there's over 600 systems that are approved by the government that have an approval or registration. If, you're, if you have a mechanical system with continuous discharge you'll have an approval and if you have a, a sewage lagoon system of sorts you'll have a registration. And again there's about half a million people in Alberta served by private systems uh, regulated by municipal affairs. So you've got wastewater at different levels. You've got the local level, you've got the government level, and you've got the federal level. And so you've got different types of programs. And at the local level, you've got bylaws. Bylaws you can pass. You can do all kinds. You can pass bylaws to restrict what goes into your system for wastewater and certain things on, on the people activities that they cannot do on, on waste on drinking water. Those are those powers are spelled out in the Municipal Government Act. Uh, again, you've got uh, private sewage treatment disposal for acreages and things uh, at the co code of practice that the municipal affairs manages that through the Safety Codes Council. And then you've got the big systems that I mentioned, the, the ones that are regulated by, by environment and sustainable resource development. And you've got uh, standards and, and, and the guidelines for that. And then of course, more recently, you've got the Fisheries Act with the new set of municipal wastewater effluent requirements to protect fish because even though you meet all the requirements of provincial legislation, there's still things you have to do to operate your systems to be careful that you don't contravene the, the new municipal wastewater effluent regulations. And we've got a good equivalency agreement they're about to sign with the federal government on that in Alberta, and so we're in good shape because we have generally good facilities. But it comes down to operation and timing of discharge, particularly on some of these systems that discharge in the spring, some of these lagoons. So the objective on there is just to work all levels of government to protect health and the environment. Wastewater sometimes plays second fiddle because we don't have sewage flowing in the streets like you have in, in the underdeveloped countries, but sanitary, we can often take these things for granted and they can get away from us if we don't uh, protect our neighbors downstream by being diligent in our wastewater operations. Now, talk a little bit about, about uh, innovation. Innovation sometimes means, you know, technology, sometimes mean the way we think and sometimes mean uh, uh, the way we 
look at different ways of, of, of uh, improving our economic uh, uh, sustainability. So innovative technologies, everybody's heard of ultraviolet radiation. It started as a, a wastewater thing and it's now used very successfully in drinking water. And the reason we use it is because there are certain types of bugs out there called protozoans and parasites like Giardia and Cryptosporidium that don't get handled by chlorine. So if you have to put the chlorine dose to kill that, you're not going to want to taste the water. So UV does a very effective job of, in some cases, to protect against Giardia and Crypto, which are things that come from warm-blooded animals. And, and if, if you're anywhere near cattle or, or, any, or beaver dams and stuff, it's very important that you have that type of technology. You get the virus control as well as the, as, as the protozoan and parasites. We've come to use more water use devices. Conservation is very important. It's a key thing. And many communities are doing much better in Alberta to conserve water. Uh, membranes, you've heard about that. They started as they started for water, drinking water, and now they're being used for for uh, for uh, north central Alberta very effectively for wastewater treatment. Very sophisticated technology. Again, operator challenge, but very good job in the end. And then you've got uh, what we call SCADA, supervisory control and data acquisition. So a lot of online monitoring to improve uh, the operation. Operators can have their iPhones or their iPads and be doing work. Works both ways. You have to know how to manually operate your plant, but once you know that, you can use a lot of these electronic devices to improve the, the, uh, the uh, instant knowledge that you need if there's a problem or something at the plant. So you can invest in that, but again, you still require the basic knowledge of operating your plant manually, but it's very effective to have these SCADA systems in place. You can share knowledge from one community to another. You can actually put a number of communities on one SCADA. Organizational uh, innovation, You've, a lot of regional systems have been built, a lot of pipelines, uh, a lot of uh, very secure uh, central larger communities that are serving as hubs to service over 200 small communities in, in for, for drinking water and wastewater services. Um, you've got consortiums where you've got larger communities, an example is say Vegreville where they have operators on contract to help the other operators out, uh, so it provides, uh, helps the younger operators move up the ladder in their classification, they're working, they've got mentorship and coaching, and, it was, and the more cost efficiency in terms of uh, the operators working in a circuit rider. And then we've just got smaller communities getting together to, to, to help each other out. Uh, Turner Valley, Black Diamond is a good example of that. That's been going on for some time and it's a good thing they had a relationship because it's now it's, it's, paying, it's paying dividends. Uh, regulatory innovation. So again, we've got safety plan, drinking water safety plans, which ultimately could take place of your approvals because you understand the risks associated. You, your monitoring and reporting is based on certain, certain types of chemicals that you have that are, are endemic to your particular area and, and you know what not to do. So you can focus on the things that are, that are, that are important to you. It makes a difference for some communities, not for others, but overall it's, it's a better way of managing your systems. So it's a know your system thing and uh, it's cost effective in the long time for consumers. And like I said, by January 1st, for most communities of 2014, uh, your inspectors will have been asking your operators, do you have one, are you getting it ready, you know, where are you going to be in time? So, ideas, innovations can be a lot different ways. We can be the way we think, the way we do things, and the way we organize ourselves. Now, challenges. We always talk about this. I gave a paper in Quebec a few years ago about small system challenges, and it doesn't matter where you are in Canada, it's this, in, anywhere in the world, it's the same thing. If you're small, you've got all these uh, small communities, each in, responsible and accountable for the operation, capital up, capital costs, maintenance, maintenance, the sustainability of the systems. That's 600 water systems and 600 wastewater systems in the province under that governance model. It's a very challenging model that we're facing right now. You have infrastructure debt for operation and maintenance. And even though you've got a ton of grants over the last 40 years and billions of dollars of grants, there's still pricing problems in small communities because it's just not possible to provide all that without charging for water that's going to draw the ire of your, of your, of your uh, constituents. And, and that's a problem. Now, one of the... Uh, uh, and again, you have to have a qualified operator. We've got shortage of operators. We've got over 2,000 operators. You think, boy, that's a lot. But small communities have problems with cover off, operator leave, operators leaving. The demographics is such that we're, we're, we're getting older. 
operators are, or the experienced operators are, are, uh, are going to retire in the next five to ten years and every time we say that we're just closer to that ten year deadline. So those are major challenges. Now it could be depending on the local situation that you have there may be other ways of, of organizing yourself. Um, we've talked about uh, despite some of these innovative practices and collaboration like consortiums and regional systems, we still got for isolated communities and smaller communities, we've still got a lot of, a lot of challenges. And so it's, it's incumbent on everybody to work together at all levels of government to see if there aren't better uh, ways of organizing ourselves or governance to, do, to deal with that. And many systems in the world, we've looked at, uh, the government did a study about five years ago, there's four years ago, there's many different jurisdictions in the, in the world that are facing the same problems in the Australians, Central Europe, mm -hmm. UK, um, that have got uh, many different, same challenges as us, but have come up with some innovation, innovative solutions, and we should be looking at that. We looked at, you know, concept of service providers at arm's length, working with operators and, and, and helping to, to gain some economics of scale by grouping systems into not just small consortiums, but to much larger areas, so the operators all work together, and, and uh, the capital costs can be lowered because you have better economics of scale. So now that we've talked about a little bit about number of this, all the aspects of the system, you've got some questions you may want to ask, especially about your communication. Is it's very important that your that your that your CAO, your uh, the kind of the operator talk to CEO, who talks to the council, this, and who has a regular attendance at council. Very important. Uh, is your drinking water protected? Are you happy in your watershed area about how the how the protection's going on? And if you're not, make sure you get involved. Is my wastewater having an adverse effect on my downstream neighbors? Uh, am I supporting my operator needs? Do I have a succession plan, which is more than just what happens when the operator retires. It's about all those things that he needs to cover off along the way, or he or she. And I do, do I have an asset management, do I have a good asset management plan in place to make my system sustainable? Am I thinking about my forward costs, bringing forward my costs? How much do I know about the legislation? Susan will talk about that, making sure you know your, your, uh, your require, your, your duties and accountabilities under the legislation. When was the last time I had an inspection and what would that inspection say? And am I in compliance with everything? And uh, what's the progress of my safety plan? It's going to be in place, my drinking water safety plan, on, on January 1st, or am I waiting until the last minute to do it? Because it's something your operator has to do because it's a know your system thing that the operator has to do. And do I have an emergency response plan? I mean, everybody in this area is, is sure knows the importance of that. Many have had them, some still don't. So that's a very important aspect. So if you're not sure, you can have an audit done of your system. Just look at all these things to make sure you're diligent. Um, keep a record of your council decisions to do that. And make sure there's an education and learning plan for council and administrators as well as for your operators who have to have their continuing education units to keep their certification active all those times. So make sure that everybody is, is, is uh, well informed there's a learning plan going on in your community. So, there's lots of things you have to know. You can reduce your risks and liabilities by, by, being, by having a good communication system. There's a lot of knowledge out there, but there's a lot of professional people where you can get that knowledge. So, there's lots of knowledge that you can get, and, and if you ever have a question, some of the inspectors that come through can tell you where to get that information. And, Last but not least, but make sure you're, you trust your operator and don't construe any questions or, or appeals for help as being weakness because it isn't. It's, it's very difficult to manage up.